Well, I want to welcome everybody today to uh, Madison and I's little vulnerability cavalcade. We're here to talk about simplifying coordinating vulnerabilities and disclosures within open source projects. Hi, everybody. My name is Madison Oliver. I work at GitHub. I go by at Taladrain professionally. I consider myself to be a transparency, a security transparency and disclosure advocate. I love vulnerability reporting and disclosure. I also love cats and World of Warcraft. Nice. I'm Krobe. I do stuff. Next slide. Yeah. We're here today to talk about CVD within open source projects. We're going to talk about some key concepts that are important to understand in this space for maintainers and researchers. We're going to talk about why it's important, how to do it, what makes it hard, and then uh, well, educate you on how you can help. So we'll give uh, some concepts and some definitions to start just to lay, lay the land. So coordinated vulnerability disclosure, or CVD, uh, is a term that you might have heard of quite a lot. <laughs> it is uh, the process of gathering information from vulnerability finders, coordinating, sharing that information between all relevant stakeholders in that process, and disclosing the existence of the vulnerability, their mitigations, the fixes, all of relevant details, various stakeholders, including the general public. There are a number of principles for coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Um, the biggest goal, right, is reducing harm throughout that whole process. You wanna presume benevolence whenever possible. Assume, assume the best, right, trust by default. <laughs> Try to avoid surprising other stakeholders in that process as well. You wanna incentivize the other party uh, to do the behavior that you're desiring from them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. There's a number of ethical considerations uh, and process improvements. Mm -hmm. And if you're old like me, you might have heard a term responsible disclosure. This is how this process used to be referred to as and is dropped out of favor just because of the implications of the word responsible. It became a kind of a, ju a value judgment. I mean, we just want to focus on the coordination aspect. So you may all sometimes hear responsible, but today it's called CBD. There's a term that frequently goes along with these disclosures, it's called embargo. And this is a period of time when the issue is kept private. And that's typically when a reporter or a project finds an issue and they work to very quickly to try to get it addressed. And so that's a period where you don't, you're not sharing things publicly. Sometimes based on the complexity of the issue, a software maintainer may include other people in their project or other projects that might be needed to help create fixes or at least kind of help coordinate as things are gonna go public and they'll be read into an embargo. But this is generally a time when the information is secret and is not publicly down. The end result of a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process could be something like a security advisory, which is an announcement or bulletin that serves to inform the general public. So this is one of the most popular, I'd say, ways to disclose vulnerabilities publicly is by using and creating and sharing a security advisory. Mm -hmm. It's an example of what one oh, might look like. <laughs> for example. There's a couple other terms that go along with advisory. Today, uh, CSAF is the Common Security Advisory Framework. This is how most vendors are working towards uh, Publishing advisories is an electronic form. Um, there is an old, this evolved from an older standard called CVRF, which was the Common Vulnerability Reporting Framework. Um, so most of your uh, vendors, uh, corporations, governments will steer towards releasing via CSAF. And that's not necessarily what um, a maintainer or a small project would use, but it's a, an option. You have the ability to use those standards. And then VEX is something new. This is a new idea. It's about a way for a developer to report the effectiveness of a piece of software to a vulnerability. There's a couple different states, like under investigation, affected, not affected, and why, and you know, affected, and here's how to get the remediation. So VEX is a newer emerging standard, and there's a couple simple ways that you can issue a VEX statement to keep your constituency informed of the status of your investigation if an issue is public. 
A vulnerability disclosure program uh, is a, a structured process that might exist at a, a company, an organization, a large project. So you as a maintainer might be running your own vulnerability disclosure program. You as a security researcher might be interacting with a, pro a project's vulnerability disclosure program. These programs typically have very clear guidelines on how and where third parties can notify the, uh, the overarching project about the security vulnerability, how you as a security researcher are expected to conduct good faith research, uh, the process that you can expect, usually including timeframes. So this might be where you would see some language around embargo, when information will be disclosed and what that looks like, and how your report will be evaluated by the project. And some examples of this would be like the kernel security team, Kube security team, Apache security team, Red Hat product security. Those are very formalized, um, either vendor or project-based security groups. And kind of a, a twist on this is uh, the bug bounty program. This is the, sometimes done through a vendor like uh, HackerOne or Integrity, but this is a program that is uh, publicly shared for researchers to come in and they are paid for their findings. And um, if you're a researcher, there are a lot of caveats and rules. So if you are a researcher, make sure you read the instructions about kind of what the rules are in participating in that program. But this is a way um, Traditionally, security researchers are invited to share the uh, findings with an entity, uh, get the fi issue fixed, and then they will potentially uh, provide assistance with the coordination, and they will uh, pay the researcher. And sometimes there are incentives on the back end to fund developers as well. But this is kind of a flavor of a VDP that if you're researching um, or if your project doesn't have a formalized team, you could explore potentially a bug bounty program. Safe harbor is a concept that is often thrown around a lot as well. Uh, so outside of information security, safe harbor is something that offers protection for liability in very certain situations under very specific circumstances. So safe harbor first really came about, especially in copyright law, uh, that <laughs> it has existed in copyright law for years. So in the context of security research and vulnerability disclosure, what Safe Harbor does is, is an ethical statement from the organization asking for vulnerability information to, to give you, as the person reporting vulnerability information, assurance that you will not uh, be subject to legal action from the organization. So this is meant to be a safe protection for the person sharing vulnerability information that has done that research, that has found that information, uh, so that they are safe. And for any researchers in the audience, not every organization provides those safe harbor protections. So if you're going to report to the organization, you probably should understand how they interact with the research community. And it also, you need to be under understanding what your uh, local uh, regulation and laws are because some uh, countries require additional steps or do not afford uh, protections against reverse engineering. So just be aware of what kind of what the rules of the road are. And uh, I think yeah. Madison and I both agree, safe harbor is the way a ethical organization should conduct themselves working with researchers. Yeah, and, and keep in mind your own local laws where you are operating as a security researcher, but also keep in mind the laws that might be impacting the company who might be located in another country. All right, so now we're going to kind of take some steps and talk about why CVD is important. Uh, many of you, this is a little tour through the years in the Wayback Machine, you may recognize some of these celebrity logos. Uh, these is a string of both uh, open and uh, proprietary vulnerabilities that have happened since uh, starting off with our dear friend Heartbleed that kind of kicked off this trend of celebrity naming of vulnerabilities back in 2014. And uh, this is a, a trend a lot of researchers use, but it, it, it's an easy mnemonic. Oh, you see uh, the bleeding heart, that's Heartbleed. But as you can see, these types of celebrity events also will generate a substantial amount of media, uh, government, and uh, customer interest. Like what is this scary thing on the news, on the front of Wall Street Journal, or on the register? It uh, generates a substantial, it kind of up-levels the pressure uh, within your vulnerability disclosure if something like this happens, if it gets branded. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. So, CBD helps us, it ensures that software maintainers have access to the resources they need to analyze, test, and fix that reported vulnerability. As somebody reports to them, whether it's an academic, a professional researcher, 
um, somebody on the project or just a you know, enthusiastic uh, community member, um, ideally the, it takes time to understand what this bug report is, I need to reproduce it, I need to understand what the impacts are. And that's why CVD is important so that the uh, developer can create a correct fix when they're ready to go out publicly. And uh, it, the intention is, you know, as all these fixes are developed, sometimes you need to read additional parties in, authorized individuals, and it could be because somebody has specialized skills in testing or analysis, or maybe you're part of a very large ecosystem like an open SSL, where there are you know, thousands of downstream communities that depend on you. So you need time to help stage that information and those fixes so that when it goes public, all consumers have access to that information at the same time. CVD can take a number of different forms. There is bilateral coordinated vulnerability disclosure, and what I mean when I say that is two parties, the reporting party and the receiving party, working together. No, nobody in the middle, nobody else involved, just the two entities. As you can imagine, that happens less and less often, especially in open source. Very rarely is, is there only one other party involved or one, only one other party who needs to be notified. What happens more often is multi-party uh, vulnerability disclosure where a number of other stakeholders are involved. Uh, it's more than just one-to-one. -one. It's really one-to-many or even many-to-many. -many. Oftentimes, there's not just one researcher who's looking into a vulnerability mm -hmm. or one vendor or project who is impacted by that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So coordinated vulnerability disclosure really brings and aims to bring together everybody who needs to be involved, who should be involved as early on as possible. There are a lot of benefits, uh, in my opinion, <laughs> for coordinated vulnerability disclosure in open source. This gives the opportunity to add vital skills and capacities for the remediation process for both the researchers and the project maintainers and developers that are involved. This allows for broader regression testing and patch review prior to public disclosure. So if you are working together as a maintainer with a researcher, especially in open source, you have often the ability to have them to share the patch with them, ask them to test it. They have spent so much time already looking at this vulnerability, looking at your project, looking at this code, that if you have the opportunity to have that level of collaboration with them, it can ensure that the patch is maybe even better than you had originally intended. Right. Ecosystems can also prepare and stage these patches and documentation to, to share for all downstream consumers at the same time. The coordinated aspect of vulnerability disclosure is really ensuring that everybody finds out at the same time with the same information. Everything is very clear, very obvious. Users know what to do, researchers know what to do, the project knows what to do, um, and everybody gets this notification typically, hopefully, when patches are released. That way your end users have a direct action that they can take install this patch. <laughs> that's, that's the goal. Mm -hmm. And all that coordination, all that testing and understanding these complex security issues that are discovered can be hard. A lot of different reasons kind of go into this. Um, a lot of times in open source, uh, the open source is as varied as the colors of the rainbow. Every project tends to handle things differently. They have different programming languages, different testing infrastructures, different ways they engage with their communities. And a lot of times, not all projects uh, accurately convey that out to the public and their downstreams of how to get a hold of us or how we manage uh, security you know, bug and defect reports. Um, so it is sometimes hard for an external party to contact these entities. And then even when you are, uh, you do potentially find the right person, because of open source, which typically tends to be a you know, use it, buyer beware, use it your own risk, they're very, there never is a warranty, but sometimes there's a support arrangement uh, as part of that. We will support N minus one versions of the software, but oftentimes you know, maintainers either uh, retire, they move on to different work, and there's no one actively maintaining that project. So when you're mailing a mailbox that was you know, 10 years old potentially, there's no one there to pick up the other line of that message. And uh, open source is all about agility and speed. Sometimes coordinated vulnerability disclosure, it takes a long time to make sure everyone's ready when it's time to go. That doesn't always match up with the times that either a researcher requires or the uh, release schedule of a project. And then, you know, not every developer has the skills to be a security expert. Sometimes they need 
a friend to help out. Maybe there's a different person on the project. They might need to get external help in writing a patch. So there's just, you know, not all team, not all open source projects have the same level of capabilities and process. <laughs> I want to talk for a moment more generally about why coordinated vulnerability disclosure is difficult even beyond open source. I am a huge advocate of reminding folks that behind all of the technology that we interact with is a human being. Or robot. For now. <laughs> for now. Uh, but there is a human behind all of this. Vulnerability disclosure is truly a human process. It is a person talking to another person. So disclosures can go awry for lots of human-related reasons, like unavailability, inability, emotions, thoughts, feelings, all of that truly does come into play here and can be some reasons why it might go awry and can also be reasons why it goes very well. But it's very important to remember the motivations for all of the parties involved in that and give people a little bit of grace. Yes. <laughs> Everyone typically, right, if you're involved in a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process, is doing so for good altruistic reasons. So showing some empathy, being understanding, these things can take some time. Uh, just remember that who you're talking to for now at least, is still a human being. Chat GPT. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's kind of get into some of the specifics of how to actually do CBD. Fun fact, Madison and I get the opportunity to collaborate together in a little group called the Open Source Security Foundation. We're part or members of the Vulnerability Disclosure Working Group. So this is a elite group of open source community members, vendors, researchers, academics, and we get together and talk about and think about how we can help the vulnerability disclosure process within open source get better. Um, over the years, we've produced a couple different CVD guides. So we currently have a CVD guide for open source maintainers and projects. So if you don't have a VDP or a bug bounty program that you pay for, we give you some tools and techniques and guidance on how you can adopt these good practices within your project, some tips and tools and templates. And in, in addition to the guide for maintainers, we've also recently re released a guide for reporters. So if you are a reporter who is commonly sharing vulnerability information with open source projects, and you want some tips or best practices on how do I share this information, who do I share it with, when do I do it, and what are my expectations of me, and what should I be able to reasonably expect from them, mm -hmm. we have a guide listing all of that as well. All of this is available on GitHub. Right. I've heard of it. Yeah, some have. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about some things that a maintainer in a project can do to be successful through the CVD process. Through the uh, venue of memes. Uh, first and foremost, I think the single most important thing a project can do to have a successful uh, vulnerability disclosure uh, interaction is publishing what your process, your policy is. You don't need to necessarily have the exact same rules and processes that a large project like Kernel or Kubernetes has. You might not be that concerned about triaging security defects. But the most important thing you can do is as you have a positive interaction is write down what you and your project and your community, what they will do and how they will react. Establishing your security team within your project before you receive an incident or a vulnerability report is also incredibly, incredibly helpful. I cannot re recommend that enough. Not every developer on your project, not every maintainer is a securityologist. They very often might not have the skills needed to respond to an incident. Uh, so identifying people in your project that do have that capability or reaching out to other community members to fill that need when, when that need arises is incredibly important. And having those channels, those communication channels, that, those avenues set up before you need them will also really, really help. Right. Then um, within the industry, there is a thing called CVE, uh, which stands for CVE. Uh, it used to stand for Common Vulnerability Enumeration, but that was too confusing, so now it just stands for itself. If you look at their, if you look at their website, it still says in, the, in their like, terminology that CVE stands for Common Vulnerability. That, that is what it does. That is not what it is. CVE means CVE. Thank you, MITRE. Um, but within that ecosystem, and a CVE is a number, a t identifier of a unique security vulnerability. And 
it was created so that you know, we have you know, many different Linux distributions or different people uh, ingesting open source software, but you all should share a common vulnerability enumerator, a number, so that downstream consumers and other developers can understand you're talking about the same thing. CVE XYZ means the same thing to two of us. And within this structure, there is an entity called a CNA, which is a CVE name, numbering authority, not naming. Bad crow. And these are organizations that are kind of like the big brothers and big sisters. Um, normally, a vendor will be a CNA for their own product set. But within the open source ecosystem, organizations like GitHub, Red Hat, and Google can act as CNAs for parts of the broader open source ecosystem. So even though your project may not have the ability to write their own CVE identifiers, you can find a buddy within the ecosystem to write that. And it's um, they have gone... Uh, they've made some strides to make the process a little easier to get an identifier, but there are other ways that you can you know, get this. You can go straight to MITRE or you can go to like one of these big brothers or big sisters. Setting up a means for private intake of the vulnerability reports that you are hoping to receive, again, before you actually receive them, will be incredibly helpful. Uh, reported vulnerability is truly a threat to any users if the software is left unfixed. So establishing a private way so that external entities can share this information with you without just you know, opening an issue on your repo, zero daying you, sharing that information with the entire world at the same time that they are sharing it with you, gives you as a maintainer the ability to respond to it and have that collaboration and communication back and forth and develop a fix before you share it with the broader community. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a way to privately receive this information from a reporter's standpoint, they are much more likely or inclined to share this information publicly by just filing an issue on your repo, and that might not be what you want. And there's a significant amount of bad actors or security researchers or community enthusiasts that are constantly monitoring your software. And any change, any issue or PR submitted, if it isn't protected through privacy, through private means, they potentially will see that and will be able to kind of reverse engineer it before you're able to develop a fix. You want to do this one? Sure. All right. Uh, on the same sort of thread, having a way so that you as a maintainer or developer of a project can create your patch or your fix in a private way, also incredibly important. There are so many folks who are watching so many repos and every single activity change on it is noticed. Mm -hmm. So having, having the ability to create this privately within the developers of your project, again, allows you to be proactive and gives you a way really to, to handle this before, before, the, before the public. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you need to, if it's part of how you wish to conduct your vulnerability coordination activities, establish that embargo list. It's easier to do it ahead of time, understanding that, you know, Crobe should talk to Madison because Madison is a heavy uh, partner and collaborator with my software, even though she's on a different project. It's important to get that established ahead of time so that everybody, again, has that ability to prepare and help assist the end consumer of whatever your software might be. Determining how you as the project maintainer or you as the security researcher are going to communicate this disclosure to the community is also incredibly important. Mm -hmm. There are a number of different ways that you can do this, right? Truly easiest, just pu publish this on an email list, right? Any, any way to get this public, make, make an issue PR, security advisory, um, blogs, commits. There's, there's so many different ways to share this information with your downstream users. Uh, it's most important to figure to figure out and determine beforehand what your users are expecting, mm -hmm. right? You want to share this in a place that they're also actually looking. It doesn't do me any good to share this on an email list if none of my developers are monitoring that email list. That truly isn't actually that helpful. So again, determining all of this as early as you can before there is an incident that you have to respond to will help ensure that when there is an incident, it goes as smoothly as possible. Mm -hmm. And this is something you would put in that security policy we told you about the very first step. So those are some of our tips and tricks and kind of an understanding of the landscape oh, from the audience here. What questions or comments do you have? Do you think you're CVD experts now? Going to go out and coordinate some vulnerabilities? What can we answer for you? Sir.
happens every minute of every day. It depends on what level, what capability. The, th the question was, how likely, how frequent does, is our bad actors monitoring uh, like GitHub, GitLab, monitoring your repositories or mailing lists? It happens all the time. It is very simple through uh, uh, tools. I can d scrape a website and then grep through it in those more sophisticated ways. But this happens all the time, and it's based off the sophistication of the threat actor. If it's a nation state or organized crime, those people have professional developers that have figured out this problem and they understand what repos are interesting for them and they'll monitor it. And even though you might not think your software is interesting, chances are there is someone that sees interest and figure, is gonna figure out a way how to exploit you in your downstream. One of the ways that this ends up being seen a lot in open source too is this concept of a drive-by CVE mm -hmm. where the maintainer or reporter or somebody who was involved in the coordinated vulnerability disclosure process did not request a CVE for one reason or another. Somebody external to that sees it because all of that information is public, requests a CVE for it, maybe unbeknownst to the maintainer, maybe with their own thoughts, feelings, or severity uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> determined that might not align with your, your disclosure. So that's, that's something I've seen very common. Mm -hmm. um, gentlemen uh, back there, and then the gentleman in the brown shirt next. Mm -hmm. So the question was around what happens if a vulnerability is discovered and reported to end-of-life software. Uh, do you want to start? Want me to start? Uh, I'm happy to start. So part part of your security policy might be we don't maintain this software below this version. That is considered end-of-life. Therefore, we will not fix it. So if somebody were to report something to you and you have clearly stated in your policy, this is end-of-life. I will not touch it. You can, you can default to that and say, hey, I, I said I was not going to address this. The, the important thing is still that that information does end up being disclosed publicly, right? Uh, not everybody updates to the latest version, unfortunately. There's a lot of very old software out there that is still actively maintained. So while you as a maintainer might make the decision to not fix something because it's end of life, I personally believe it's still important to share that information publicly and the researcher might. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it would be maybe a difference in expectations. Yeah, it, and from a project standpoint, it's critical to state what your, how you wish to desire to support this software. And you know, some, of, some people, like if you're a part of a large foundation, they have more resources, they have longer support tails, others don't. From a researcher perspective, um, you should do your best to understand what that project's life cycle is um, there are other methods you could go through a coordinating body like CERT CC or JP CERT, depending. Um, but there, there are ways to do it. But at the end of the day, not all software is supported forever. And if the researcher is not getting uh, action on their requests, you are uh, perfectly entitled to help warn uh, the public and those consumers. Mm -hmm. They will say, we do not issue CNA CD numbers for how to fill software. And so then you as a researcher are responsible, if you want to be, it's always a choice. But you are, if you, if you think it's important to get the vulnerability disclosed publicly, you need to be the one going to my, which is the parent CNA, and saying, I need a CD number for this thing that vendor is claiming is out of scope and end of life and will not issue CD and from a researcher perspective, feel free to talk to Jonathan. He has a lot of experience in this, and he actually works within the OpenSSF to help try to create some new norms on how to do mass vulnerability finding campaigns and trying to help. He was actually instrumental in helping us shape uh, the finder guide. Um, I'm a consumer of CD information. Mm -hmm. That's what it starts with, disclosure process. Uh, um, do you see the CNAs eventually adopting PURLs as a, uh, you know, a default or a, a first-class citizen as an identifier in these CVEs um, so that we can better consume this information? So uh, today, I do not see that happening. In the future, um, 
how CVE works is it's controlled by an organization called MITRE, which is a US-based entity. As a CVE is issued, it goes out into something called the National Vulnerability Database. It's a public resource. And uh, just last week, actually, MITRE and the NVD team stated that they are looking for both uh, private entities like corporations as well as open source to collaborate on how they might be able to evolve the NVD. There are other standards that you can use. There's um, the OSV, which is an open source uh, security foundation project that kind of federates ID, um, vulnerability identifiers. Uh, GSD, the Global Security Database, is another open source vulnerability database. So there are other ways you can get an identifier as a researcher and as a consumer you probably want to take a look at. But in the future, there are there will be steps and our, our OSV team within OpenSSF is going to be uh, getting on um, NVD's uh, list to talk to because actually we've had a lot of conversations because um, uh, CVE and NVD work very well with classic software, legacy, you know, large corporation software doesn't, is not quite as compatible with open source agile iterative processes. So I think we'll be able to find a better partnership, but I don't have a timeline on when that is. But in the future, yes but there are alternatives you can take a look at. Thank you. Way in the back. Uh, are you seeing any uh, uh, researchers or even malicious actors using chat GPT or <laughs> So the question is, uh, are we aware of any bad actors using uh, or, or, or researchers. anybody, researchers, bad actors using artificial intelligence tools like chat GPT to uh, find vulnerabilities or find exploit? Officially, I am personally unaware um, being a 25-year uh, security person, I can guarantee uh, people are. If it's on the internet, somebody's going to use it and try to break it. Um, but I don't know that there has been, there's not a large body of evidence or research yet. Uh, but again, that's not my, my personal area to look into. But I'm, I'm fairly certain that if they are not, they, they very soon will be. Because again, it's, it's a very useful set of tools. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yes, you can. Uh, Justin Murphy, uh, I hesitate to say it. I work for the US government uh, nice. at CISA. Um, I work with Alan Friedman on the SBOM Vex work. Oh, I love Alan. Now, is he going to show up? Yeah. <laughs> you said the word. Uh, no, he will. <laughs> that's why I'm here, actually. Uh, but, uh, Krobe, I know you've been involved with some of our working groups and I appreciate, have. appreciate your input all the time. Um, so I, I also happen to work for uh, the branch in CISA that handles uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Uh, and would love to hear from you, anybody in the audience, uh, what are some things that uh, the US government can do? Uh, what are we, I guess you know, we'd love to hear what we're doing well, but more importantly, what are some things that we could do better and, um, and things that we could do perhaps to incentivize uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure and being more approachable? Mm -hmm. Um, and things like that. And, and I do have a second question um, about the working group. Um, uh, I'm curious, do you have, and is it open to uh, US government participation if we had a, a member from our team participate in the uh, vulnerability disclosure working group? Is that possible? Wow, it's like we planted that question. Yeah. So to the first question, I have a whole team of excited people that would love to talk to you about how we can better work together to match uh, the speed of open source and kind of find some middle ground between classic and new Coke, uh, for example. Um, secondly, every OpenSSF working group is completely open to anyone that's interested in participating. Uh, there's some additional things you can do as a paying member, but a lot of the people that participate in our working group, and especially this working group, because I get a lot of academics and researchers pop in, totally open to the public. All our meetings are public, every meeting is recorded. You can watch thousands of hours of Zoom calls on YouTube if you, that's your thing. Uh, but um, 
like I partner with Alan a lot, and actually Alan does collaborate with some of our other groups. He participates in the end user working group quite a lot. But if somebody was interested in collaborating with that specific group, we would love that. We would love that from everywhere, because again, we have, like we talk with Thomas uh, over in Germany quite a lot as well. Uh, anyone that's interested, uh, we welcome your collaboration. Yeah, I appreciate that. Never hurts to help. Yeah. Actually, just a comment and, and related to that previous question with ChatGPT, uh, we sneak disclosed three vulnerabilities, but they were not with a score of 5.4, and they were not on the NVD at the time. It took about a week. And it was fun just to ask ChatGPT, what score would you give to this? And we copy paste this exact description. And ChatGPT gave a 7.5. So I said, whoa, this is a high severity. A week later, on the MVD, they were 7.5. <laughs> and I also participate in the CVSS working group. I participate in an other organization called FIRST, the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams, and they help kind of curate uh, CVSS. And uh, the single greatest failure of CVSS is that a human does it, and it can be a little subjective. They try to mathify it, and it does a good job and CVSS was never meant to be a description of risk. It was a kind of a description describing how this problem works and give you kind of a severity. Uh, and depending on who the analyst is looking at it, what their knowledge of the particular package is, this is a fight I used to have all the time with Red Hat because Red Hat would perform the analysis and other people would perform a different analysis and our customers were kind of caught in the middle. But it really, it, it depends on Who's doing, what is the analyst doing that context, how experienced they are? And uh, you know, potentially, the different analysts see the problem differently. They, you know, they, they might see, well, that's, that scope has changed or that scope is unchanged. And that, that really, you get into that. Or some people actually reflect on things like the temporal uh, space, kind of considering other compensating controls that should be in place. But yeah, you, you will see some variance in how different parties score. You'll see variance from the same analyst potentially scoring yeah. things. Yeah, that's very common. Honestly, evaluating severity for a vulnerability is so very subjective. The CVS spec does, does the best that it can truly to outline how you should do that. But much like a comment we made earlier, that, that was maybe not initially designed with open source in mind. So there are some, some areas within open source vulnerabilities where using that to gauge your severity might not work the best because that was not initially how it was designed. And I would say stay tuned. They are about ready to release the CVSS v4 spec, and it is much more robust, and it kind of more aggressively incorporates um, the temporal stuff. Um, we greatly encourage people to actually do their own scoring internally based off of their priorities, and there's a whole section around safety and human life. Um, it's, it's a great improve. It's a great evolution. Um, it will never be perfect. But um, I think they've done a really good job with the next one, next version. So ideally, once that is in place and people are doing that a little more, ideally we'll see a little bit more consistency of the scoring. Jonathan? <laughs> it's not out yet. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Uh, the question the was, Jonathan asked when a vendor was going to start releasing CVSS v4 scores. Likely after the spec is released. <laughs> Sometime after that is what I'd say. And that is a, a big conversation of the working group there, is they're trying to decide how to roll it out. It's going to require some new training of the analysts. Um, you know, if anything new, you'll have a little bit of growing pains. But I would expect you'll start seeing uh, commercial organizations issuing CVSS v4 scores probably the end of this year. And you'll see uh, 2024 will be a year where you'll have both three and four. And you know some people still require, I think, one. Uh, people love two, too. Yeah. So you, that, but you will see uh, the majority of vendors start issuing v4 probably towards the end of this year. Any other questions while we're here? You should look. Is it, is it, are, they, are they reposted uh, open source security foundation meetings? 
God, no. <laughs> so I, my two channels, one is the security on happy hour, which was a bunch of P-cert people we got together and drank and talk about security things like CVSS. And then uh, chips and salsa is my corporate uh, shilling of uh, things and talking to security researchers. So question. There, yeah. Um, so I, I heard you mention uh, first, and, and so, so I, I and uh, I, I said on the Common Security Advisory Framework um, nice. uh, Technical Committee with Thomas Schmidt from BSI. We are doing some. If you're going to be at first conference, which also happens to be in Canada, in Montreal, Montreal. Um, in a month. Um, we are doing some uh, writing workshops, both for beginners and, and more mature users. Uh, uh, so we'd love to have any participation if you're curious. Uh, question about CSAF. Um, how are, you, you mentioned it in, in your talk uh, briefly. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing from an adoption standpoint? Is there resistance to it? Is it just, uh, uh, are you seeing a lot of adoption? Um, what, what, are, what are you seeing uh, out there that, and, and are there things that we, you know, as part of the technical co committee, could I bring back that mm -hmm. uh, might be helpful in, uh, in encouraging uh, adoption and things like that? Do you have thoughts? Yeah, I'll go briefly. Please. Uh, what, what I have seen is it seems to be fairly industry and focus specific. So the, a lot of the benefits of CSAF, at least from my opinion, are really for incident response teams and those responding to vulnerabilities. It, it is a little bit harder for downstream users to make a lot of benefit from that information. Um, it would be kind of hard for a developer, I think, from their standpoint to create a CSAF document. So I think there's, it is very good at this n more narrow scope. And if we could make it a little more agile, which I th seems to be the theme of our talk, if we can make things more agile and more easily usable and consumable by the open source community, I think it would really grow in adoption. Yeah. And from a commercial perspective, you'll see it's been slow uptake for people to issue CSAF. And those are people that have security teams and they have paying constituents that demand that. Um, from an open source perspective, I've seen very little adoption because again, it's not, it doesn't benefit the maintainer or the project. But um, one of the goals of our volume disclosure working group and then some of the other efforts, like we're proposing an open source security incident response team one of the efforts there would be to try to create tooling so that it would be dead simple for a developer as they are fixing an issue. When they do that commit, it potentially could issue a CSAF, it could issue a VEX statement. Um, and then we, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out um, one of the next steps of the working group is to start to collaborate with OASIS and um, the other, um, like uh, Cyclone DX and SPDX, the other kind of VEX adjacent and CSAF adjacent groups. So. Not there yet, uh, but hopefully we can make it very simple for a maintainer and project to click a button and uh, out it goes. Thanks. Do, do you see uh, any usage of CVRF at all? Um, or the same? Okay. It, for years, it was like basically just Red Hat and Cisco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and even like Red Hat just started issuing, they're one of the biggest champions. I worked there for seven years. Uh, they were one of the biggest champions of this. And uh, they've only been doing CSAF advisories for like a year. And that's one of the most progressive. Um, my organization, Intel, is just now starting to release CSAF because our, customer, our large OEM customers are demanding it. They want electronic advisories. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a slow adoption process. Yeah, and I think we've seen that honestly pretty commonly across vulnerability specifications or vulnerability reporting and disclosure tooling. A lot of that in my opinion, was made for use by the security teams, by the security responders, not necessarily by the engineers or de the developers that are working on the patches or fixing that. And in an open source community, especially a small one, those people are one and the same very, very often. So the tooling and the specifications that exist currently weren't necessarily made with them in mind, which I think has led to some of the low or slow adoption um, because a lot of assumptions were made and a lot of there's a lot of expectation uh, that doesn't necessarily match some of the reality we're seeing. Yeah, but I think the key to that is going to be tooling automation, getting incorporated into pipelines and part of like the source forges, so that as they're doing their work, it's just a check. Would you like to do an advisory? Tick, boop, and away it goes. Yep, just lower the bar to entry. Make it as easy as possible. 
And if you capture the information in the vulnerability report and through your process, it's a pretty simple matter to kind of take key pieces of that and put it into an advisory format. Any other questions or comments? So we're all coordinated vulnerability disclosure experts now? Everyone's going to go home and put a security policy on their repo? <laughs> well, we thank you for your time and attention and your good questions. Uh, we hope you all enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.